Okay, this is a map of, uh, of Turkey. And the reason why we're bringing this up is because we're shifting gears now, uh, at least we're going to shift in a second here, uh, to the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. And there's going to be a first, second, it's, it's really difficult, first missionary journey of Paul, second missionary journey of Paul, third missionary journey of Paul, three missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. And a lot of them take place in this area of Turkey. So Turkey is going to be or what they call Asia Minor. This is Asia Minor or Turkey, and Israel's going to be down there off the map. And over here is Greece, okay? So you've got Greece and, and Macedonia. Macedonia is up there, Greece is down here, and this is Turkey. And you remember that Paul came from Tarsus. Tarsus is right there, kind of in the place where the Turkey meets over with Syria and stuff. Tarsus is not too far, just a little bit west of there, but Tarsus. And then Paul's going to travel on his missionary journeys here. Here's Ephesus. Paul's going to be there for a while. And Corinth that we just talked about here is where Corinth is. So, um, And what we'll be doing in the next uh, few hours is going over uh, the first, second, and third missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. And uh, so this is just kind of a map. You guys have got it in the PowerPoints and things, so there's no need to kind of write this down per se, but because um, you can pull the map actually from from the PowerPoint. But I love this map. It's a good, it's kind of a satellite image of it. I think it's a good one. Now, here's a more schematic or cartoon version of what's happening. And this is the first missionary journey. The first missionary journey is like basically 46 to 48 AD. Now, I don't want you to know the date. I don't do much with dates in this course. There's one date here that I want you to know. I want you to know 50 AD is the Jerusalem Council, okay? So we're going to come back to this, but 50 A.D. is the Jerusalem Council. Now, when did the first missionary journey take place? Before the first, before the Jerusalem Council. So this first missionary journey of Apostle Paul takes place before the Jerusalem Council. The Jerusalem Council is at 50 A.D. This is just before that, so it's basically 46 to 48 uh, A.D., just before the, the Jerusalem Council. Where do all the three missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul start from? They all start from this place here, Antioch in Syria. There's a place called Antioch in Syria, and this is where the missionary journeys of Paul, they all three of them started Antioch. Do you remember that Antioch was the place where Christians were first called Christians? Antioch was the first called Christians. And we're going to see in the book of Acts that actually the Christians go by three, uh, they have three, you know, okay, um, three things, basically they're called People of the way, people of the way, and so this way is, is a big thing, the way, and, and actually in the NIV, you'll see it uh, with a capital W, people of the way. They're also were called the sect, when they were, uh, the Christians were kind of like inside Judaism, they were called the Nazarenes, and so they were viewed like you had the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and now you had the Nazarenes, because they followed the man from Nazareth, Jesus Christ, okay? So the Nazarenes was a second term. So the followers of the way, the Nazarenes, and then they were called Christians first at Antioch. So Antioch and Syria. Now as soon as I say Antioch and Syria, what does that tell you? Are there going to be several other Antiochs? It's like saying Warsaw, Indiana. I've got to say Indiana because if I just say Warsaw, you're going to think Warsaw, Poland. Okay? But there's a Warsaw in Indiana. So what happens? Paul goes on his first missionary journey. And the Spirit calls them. And who do they go with? This is in Acts chapter 13. Um, and what happens on the first missionary journey? Let me just start out. The Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas, actually his name means son of consolation. It's actually Barnabas was actually his nickname. But uh, Barnabas, son of consolation, he seems to have been a big fellow who was an encourager of others, and he particularly worked with the Apostle Paul, who was Saul. And do you remember the early church didn't like Saul initially because Saul was killing Christians? And so when Saul actually converted to Christ, some of the Christians said, hey man, this guy was killing people before, I'm not sure we can trust him, okay? Is he trying to infiltrate and he's going to kill us too? And things, so people were kind of stiff-armed him. Barnabas took Saul and brought him into the community. So Barnabas is kind of a, this guy is a peacemaker and a reconciler and that kind of guy, nice guy, really nice guy, son of consolation. We even have uh, on this campus, I believe, we have Barnabas groups. That is, they're, they're encouragers. They're known for their encouraging. 
Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them out. Okay, they pray over them, lay their hands on them, and they send them out. And so these guys are apostolo. They've, they're sent out and things. And um, notice the role of the community. It isn't just Paul and Barnabas saying, God has called us and therefore we need to go. No, the community calls and, and, and acknowledges them, and the community sanctions them and says, okay, you guys can go, and, and so they go out. Where's the first place they go? The first place they go is to Cyprus. This island here off the coast of Syria and just below Turkey is called Cyprus, from what I'm told from a man who lives there and who's lived all over the world, that Cyprus is one of the most beautiful places in the world. Never been there. I'd like to go there, though. But just uh, the way Richard Cleave has talked about uh, Cyprus, it's just a beautiful, beautiful place. So why did they go from Antioch to Cyprus? Well, that's Barnabas' hometown. That's where Barnabas was from, Cyprus. So Barnabas is saying, hey, you know, Christianity and things, I want to spread Christianity to my home territory. And so he goes here. They go over to Paphos here, Salamis and Paphos. And basically what happens, um, there's this guy named Bar-Jesus who's there. And there's a governor, um, Sergius Paulus. So you have a governor, Sergius Paulus. You've got a, a bar Jesus, which means son of Jesus. By the way, were there many Jesuses back then? I think some people think you know Jesus is you know a special name, Jesus. Do you understand that Jesus is simply the Hebrew name for Joshua? Jesus is the Greek form of the Hebrew word Joshua. Question: Were there tons of Joshuas back in Jesus' day? Yes, there were. Okay, and so we, we know that. I mean, from the records, if you go back in the records, you can see there are many, many Jesus back there. Okay? And that's why they say Jesus of Nazareth. They have to specify which one and that kind of thing. Well, here you've got basically this Bar Jesus. So he's the son of Bar, means son of an Aramaic. Bar Jesus, the son of Jesus. He's a sorcerer. And what happens is this Bar Jesus sorcerer comes into it and gets into it with Paul in front of the governor, Sergius Paulus. And Paul blinds this guy, or, you know, God uses God's power, and the bar Jesus is blinded right in front of Sergius Paulus, who's the governor. The governor sees it, and he kind of like is wowed, and it's like, it's amazing what happened. And basically, Sergius Paulus then um, is convinced to believe, why was Sergius Paulus, the governor of Paphos, why was, he, why was he convinced to believe? Because he saw this guy blinded, and he says, whoa, this is guy, has got the power of God. And so he believes. So is there a connection between evidences, sign miracles, and belief? And the answer is yes, in this case there was. Now, not in all cases there are, but in this case there was. So the Sergius Paulus accepts Christ, he's the governor. Bar-Jesus is blinded for a time and stuff, and this is Barnabas. Okay, that takes place at Cyprus. Now, what happens next? And I want to go through these places kind of single by single. So Cyprus, Bar-Jesus, Sergius Paulus believes... Bar Jesus is blinded. Now they set off and they come up here to Perga. Now at Perga, something happens. In other words, in Perga, in Acts chapter 13, actually this, the first missionary journey of the Apostle Paul is this is all Acts 13 stuff. Acts 13, 13, Bar Barnabas and Paul are followed by John Mark, who's a young man. John Mark is a young man, uh, taken from a wealthy family, probably a guy who wrote the book of Mark. A young man at the time. Actually, he was related. He was like a nephew to Barnabas, okay? He was kind of like uh, related to Barnabas as a nephew and stuff, a younger nephew or something like cousin or something. And, and basically, John Mark quits at Perga. So John Mark goes back home, possibly to Jerusalem, possibly to Antioch. But anyways, John Mark quits. Let me just read this. From Pathos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Okay, so he went back actually to Jerusalem in Acts 13, 13. There. Now you say, well, that's not a big deal. He just, uh, you know, he, he just went back home and things like that. It was a big deal. And actually Paul got so upset that when they start out on the second missionary journey, Paul says, I'm not taking John Mark with me this time. I'm not going to take somebody who quit like that. I'm not going to take him. And Paul objects to John Mark being uh, Paul and Barnabas and John Mark are going to go out on the second missionary journey. Paul says, I won't go with them. And the tension between Barnabas and Paul was so big that it split their friendship. And actually, Barnabas took John Mark 
and went back to Cyprus, Paul took Silas, did not go with Barnabas and John Mark. He picked somebody else, Silas, and Paul heads off by himself on the second missionary journey. So the tension between Paul and Barnabas over John Mark was so strong that it broke their friendship. And these guys had been through like war together. They, I mean, the, Paul and Barnabas were really, really close because of the things they went through. So John Mark quits at Perga. By the way, you guys remember, I think we've did it, done it before, but in, I love this passage over in 2 Timothy 4, I think it's 11, I'm guessing, but I think it's 4, 11, or 12 in there. Paul, at the end of his life, in 2 Timothy, Paul knows he's going to die. So Paul is at the very end of his life, probably around 68 AD, and Paul knows he's going to die. At the end of his life, he says, Timothy, go get John Mark and bring him here to me because he's profitable for me and my ministry. So John Mark, at the end of his life, Paul and John Mark are reconciled, and Paul asks that John Mark be brought to him at the end of his life. So it's kind of like it's an interesting thing. Earlier, Paul would have nothing to do with him because he quit. So that's at Perga. Now, Paul heads up to Antioch. You say, oh no, another Antioch. This is Pisidian Antioch. And by the way, why do we have so many Antiochs? Well, part of the reason why we get so many Antiochs is there was this guy named Antiochus. And remember back from the Alexander days, there was Antiochus. And basically the Antiochus went around naming all these places and people naming them for him and things like that. And these places, Antioch and stuff. So what happens here? In Acts chapter 13, they arrive at Antioch in Pisidia up here. This is going to be what I'm going to call Galatia. There's kind of a northern Galatia and a southern Galatia, and there's big arguments over this stuff, but we're just going to call it southern Galatia here. And so he goes to Antioch, and in chapter 13, verses 44 and following, it says this. On the Sabbath day, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Okay. Now, when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and talked abusively against what Paul was saying. Paul responds, Since you reject it and do not consider yourself worthy for eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. So at Antioch, basically here's what Paul does. Paul goes into a city. First thing he does is he scopes out where is the synagogue. So where is the synagogue? And he finds a Jewish synagogue. He goes into the Jewish synagogue. In the first week, he's a traveling rabbi kind of person. So he preaches in the synagogue. Usually the people are pretty wild. Paul is a very bright and very good preacher. And so basically people are wowed. The next week then, the, the crowds double. And actually people from the towns come. But then what happens is with all the crowds, the Jews get jealous. And then as they get jealous, they start opposing Paul's message. And then they usually kick him out, beat him up, stone him, do something nasty to Paul, or Paul flees. Okay, So that you have that here. Paul preaches the first time in the, in the synagogue. People hear it. The next time, all the townspeople show up. The Jews get jealous. There's opposition. And Paul basically says, okay, at this point now, we realize we've, we've offered the gospel to the Jews. We are now turning to the Gentiles. And so you get this turning of the Gentiles that happens at Antioch in Pisidia here. From there, Antioch, he goes down to Iconium. And Iconium, I don't want to dwell on that very long in there. Um, it is interesting, too. Uh, Acts 13.48, it says, All who were appointed to eternal life believed. Who believed? All those who were appointed to eternal life. So you get the free will, you know, kind of, was it their choice that they believed, or was it predestined that they believed? And that comes up in Acts chapter 13, verse 48. It's an interesting thing outside the book of Romans, that same kind of uh, phraseology and things. So what happens uh, at Iconium? At Iconium, Paul preaches again, and what happens is some of the Jews from here come down, poison the mind. There's a plot in Iconium to kill Paul and get rid of him. And so there's a plot going. P Paul finds out about the plot, and then he flees. Okay, So Paul, at Iconium, there's a plot to damage Paul. Paul finds out about the plot. He flees to Lystra. Okay, Is there ever a time to flee? Is there ever a time to run? And the answer is, yeah, Paul, in Iconium, he turns, turns tail and runs because they're making a plot to kill him. When he gets down to Lystra, Lystra is going to be a special place. Uh, you need to know there's several things that happen here that are, are, are very significant. Um, 
First of all, let me actually check this out. Chapter, this is Acts chapter 14. Um, Acts chapter 14, verse 12. Okay. And what's going to happen here at Lystra is, is pretty interesting on a number of levels. Okay. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual, as usual into the Jewish synagogue. They spoke there so effectively, a great number of Jews and Gentiles believe. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentile, poisoned their minds, against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord who confirmed the message of grace and things. And the, there was a plot afoot and basically they found out about it and they fled and they fled to Lystra. Now here's what happens at Lystra. In Lystra there sat a crippled man in his feet who is lame from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking Paul looked directly and saw that he had faith to be healed. Notice the connection of faith and healing. And called out, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. Small town, probably. and Everybody in the town knows this guy's crippled. He's been crippled since birth. The guy all of a sudden stands up on his feet and he's jumping up and down. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language. Remember how we said there were these dialectical languages? So they shouted in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down in human form. And Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermas because he was the chief speaker. So what you get is they're first called gods at Lystra. He heals this crippled guy. The townspeople conclude these guys must be God. They just made this guy walk. Barnabas apparently was bigger than Paul, and Barnabas is considered Zeus, and, and Paul is considered Hermas because he's the main speaker, kind of like the prophet who speaks for God. And Zeus doesn't say much, but Hermas talks all the time. So Paul, uh, there's an interesting description of the, and the acts of Paul and Thecla we'll get to later, where Paul is described as kind of being short, uh, rotund. Uh, I don't like this part. He's bald-headed. Maybe that's good. I'm like Paul. Okay, bald-headed with a hooked nose, with a hooked nose, and he's very friendly. And so Paul was this kind of bald-headed, friendly, rotund guy with a big nose. And so he kind of fits the role, if you know, if you've been around in Middle Eastern culture, there's a lot of people like that. So anyways, this is Paul. But Paul, okay, so Paul, Zeus is Barnabas, Paul is Hermes, and then what happens? Okay, all of a sudden then, there's bad stuff starts happening, you know, again, there's this opposition from the Jews and things, and all of a sudden the people go, and they get so angry at Paul, what do they do? Let me just read here what they did. When the crowd saw, okay, they cried out, he's, he's Zeus and stuff, and he's telling them, and some of the Jews came down from Antioch and Iconium, so it's kind of like pilfered in, and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the side of the city, thinking he was dead. So here, the apostle Paul is stoned to the point that people thought that the guy was actually dead. They drag him out of the city and throw him out of the city. So the place where he was considered, you know, he heals a cripple, that would be one thing. They're made gods at Lystra, Zeus and Hermas, and then after the Jews poison their mind, Paul is stoned to the point that they think they've killed him and drag him outside the city. Paul is stoned. By the way, would that bust up his body, his head? Other people have suggested that Paul had a problem with his eyes and seeing, possibly having rocks hit into his head, busted up his eyes and stuff like that. You just never know. We don't know all the details about it. We do know that Paul had a thorn in the flesh, that he played, prayed God three times to take it away. We also know Paul possibly, he tells in one other place that, that you guys would have torn out your eyes for me. And so there's something maybe possibly with his eyes that are bad as a result of this stuff. But anyways, Lystra is where Paul gets stoned to the point of almost death. He's made gods there from healing the, the cripple. Do you see how fickle the crowds are? The crowds are hailing him as being this great, you know, God healer thing. And then just a few, you know, verses later, wham, bam, they're, they're stoning him to death. So I'm saying is you can't trust crowds. Crowds praise one minute and then they do the other. But the other thing, and let me just say this while we're here now, Lystra. So Lystra is the place where Paul gets beat really badly, okay? Made gods first from healing the cripple, and then stoned to the point of death. It's from Lystra on the second missionary journey that the Apostle Paul pulls one of his most faithful disciples, and that is Timothy. Timothy is going to be from Lystra. 
the place where Paul got stoned to the point of death, Timothy is going to be from Lystra. So he's going to pick him up. No, not on the first missionary journey where we are now, but it'll be about, I don't know, five, six years later, it'll be, he'll pick up Timothy from Lystra. He goes to Derby, finally last, uh, goes down to Derby, and at Derby, um, an interesting kind of conclusion uh, to the mission. In Acts chapter 14, verse 22, here's how the first missionary journey concludes at Derby, and Paul, they make this conclusion. We must go through many hardships to enter into the kingdom of God. We must go through many hardships to enter into the kingdom of God. And so Paul then ends his first missionary journey with this reflective note. There's a lot of suffering. If we're proclaiming the gospel of Christ to enter the kingdom of God, we've got to go through many suffering. Paul then retraces his steps up to Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, Perga, we, 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 all the way home. Okay? And that's the first missionary journey. It takes place about 46 to 48 AD. We don't remember that date. What we remember is 50 AD is the Jerusalem Council, right after the first missionary journey. After the first missionary journey, Paul's going to go from Antioch, return to Antioch. He's going to go down to Jerusalem, and they're going to have the Jerusalem Council. Um, actually, well, Peter will be down there for the Jerusalem Council in 50 AD in Jerusalem. So that's the first missionary journey. Now, okay, let's just buzz through this. Okay, I'm sorry, 48 to 49, actually. So this is directly in front of 50 AD, first missionary journey in Central Asia, uh, Southern Galatia. Three levels, Christians called, okay. He goes from there to Cyprus. We said Cyprus was where Bar Jesus was blinded. Sergius Paulus was the governor, actually accepted Christ there. That was a good thing. And convinced Sergius Paulus to believe, okay. We talked about God's miracles and healing. 